Hey everyone, welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the show, thanks for listening today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. Today we're going to be answering questions from our listeners. If you'd like to have a question answered on a future episode of the podcast, the best way to do that is by signing up for our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And you can also reach us on social media or through email at contact at beingwellpodcast.com. So to help me answer some really great questions, I'm joined as usual by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So dad, how are you doing today? Doing great and really looking forward to this grab bag. Yeah, same. I think that we got some really great ones here. A lot of them sort of orbited the topic of uh, painful experiences in childhood, including developmental trauma, but we got a wide selection here. So we'll be diving into a variety of different topics. As always, when we're answering these questions on the show, pretty much all of these questions we could have spent a full episode on. They are great, detailed questions that have a lot in them. But uh, for purposes of this episode, we're going to try to do each of them in probably under 10 minutes if we can restrain ourselves to that, which uh, sometimes we fail to do. But okay, here's the first question. After years of unhealthy, even toxic relationships, I find myself seeing someone who offers all I could want in terms of emotional awareness, sensitivity, and care. But now that it's here, I find myself struggling to accept it. I feel like I'm just waiting for the inevitable rejection, pain, and loss. I'm concerned that my anxiety about this will crush this new and beautiful opportunity. What do you think, and what can I do? I think that your experience is really common and understandable. And one of the first things to do is to be mindful of it and compassionate uh, toward yourself about it and not um, shame yourself for being ashamed to put it a certain kind of a way. And uh, one way to understand it that I found really useful, I learned some years ago, is I think about the triangular track. It's got three sides to it. And it starts out with uh, your authentic self-expression, authentic expression of yourself. Uh, You want something, you feel something, you see something. And then based on history comes the expectation of pain that was associated with that natural, authentic self-expression, either because you experienced it or because you saw it happening around you. And then the third um, edge of the triangular track uh, is the defense against the pain, the coping mechanism to try to avoid that pain. And all of that can happen in a second or two inside your mind Mm, or even mm -hmm. almost semi-consciously. So here we are, you're in a situation where you're, you're with someone who's wonderful, good on you. First of all, that wonderful person would not want to be with a lot of people, but has chosen to be with you. And you can take that as pure evidence. I want to make that as an aside. But then what does that elicit in us? If we're with the person that we've longed to be with, understandably, our longings for closeness, longings to be more real, uh, to move into depths of relationship, what historically, probably, have those been associated with? Oh, the second leg of the triangular track, pain. So then comes the coping mechanism, which is to get out as fast as you can um, with a lot of anxiety that if I don't get out now, it'll be really horrible. So that's a way to understand it. How do we solve it? One way to solve it is through being aware of what's happening inside your mind that's a different movie than the actual movie of reality around you. And to be able to tease those apart a little bit. Like, oh, my partner still likes me. Internally be clear about the fact that it's actually going okay. And then the second thing is really profound and it's scary, but it's it's real. It's the fundamental way to be with this sort of thing, which is to realize that you cannot ultimately control what that other person does. Mm, mm -hmm. Try to live ultimately with the ending of the relationship. Paradoxically, a willingness to, or capacity to be at peace with the relationship ending can be a helpful factor in it continuing. Mm. Because then, meanwhile, just be your super cool self. Be your own natural good self, right? Be, mm, mm-hmm. be all those things that drew that person to you. It's not like you have to walk on eggshells and be perfect every performance on a foundation of love, being loving, 
communicate, negotiate, and clean up your side of the street. Those three just really stand out. To be a person who's loving, who communicates, who works out agreements and solves problems, you know, repairs issues, negotiate, and takes responsibility for doing your job in the relationship, whatever that is. And then if you do those things and that person leaves you, they're a schmo <laughs> and somebody else <laughs> who's probably at least as good, if not better, who will be coming yeah. around the corner. Sure. Well, that was great, Dad. I think that's, I mean, there's already so much in what you were saying there, right? But something that I just want to emphasize here in general is that our fears don't protect us. That's so deep, Forrest. Wow. Yeah, and so I, I just want to start there because, like, why why do we why do these fears arise for us often? Yeah. And it's like because there's a part of us that thinks that the fear will keep us safe if we just um, anticipate the problem enough or try to deal with it in all these different ways. Maybe in this case, by really being carefully on the lookout for disappointment or maybe by putting on a real mask and performing a certain kind of way in front of this person so that uh, so that they, they like me, they really do like me in this case, uh, rather than being kind of inevitably disappointed by me in some way that causes them to leave. Like all of these things, right? Our, our fears mm -hmm. inspire these behaviors in us. But the truth is that they don't actually stop what we're afraid of from coming about almost ever, if anything they make it more likely over time. Like we we bring about the things that we're concerned about simply by being concerned about them sometimes because you enter into all of these anxious or avoidant or just kind of generally inauthentic behaviors inside of a relationship that, hey, maybe they work for a minute or two, mm -hmm. but over the long run, like it's no way to live. It's no way to be. And to your point, Dad, it's also probably not what drew that person to you in the first place. And so I think one of the big tasks here is to unpack how we think about fear in general and how we think about these behaviors in general and whether we consider them to be preventative or not. Because as long as we keep on being like attached to the defense in that way, it's very, very difficult to change the behavior because we've convinced ourselves that it's doing something for us. But once we kind of let that down, all of a sudden we, we have so much more space to operate from. That's great. Well, what's the next question? Okay, great. Are there any known contraindications for getting CBT or other very top-down therapies when you've had adverse childhood experiences, complex PTSD, and so on? I have a social anxiety disorder, and I found many of my CBT sessions unhelpful. Is it just me, or is it my therapist, or is there maybe something else going on here? So, what do you think, Dad? This is... A a very deep question, and it opens a lot of doorways into a fundamental inquiry about uh, what are we seeking when we do psychotherapy and what's the measure of it working? And what are some appropriate ways to approach it as a client uh, when you're not getting much, if anything, out of it? The whole point is good change that lasts. So inside that context, uh, we, we do therapy, we do these treatments because we want the results, right? Maybe the result is a healing of something that's really, really painful and compromising. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we want is someone we can just routinely check in with. Maybe we want to talk about some practical problems, whatever it is. We're there because we want something out of it. Uh, and hopefully the therapist is there to help us get something out of it. But it's actually scandalous how often... Uh, people will go through a therapy and then they'll kind of shrug and they'll say, well, I didn't really get much out of it, if anything at all. That's not infrequent. It's also the case that often people will say, I love my therapist. I've gotten so much out of it. They saved my life. But the point is to get value. So you have the right as a client to seek value and you should bring it up with your therapist if you're not getting value, much as if you had a medical mm -hmm. doctor and you were being treated for some illness and you weren't getting any better. All that's very important, and I've seen many, many clients, uh, because of the kind of power differential, including in the archetypal structure of the culture, the therapist, who on the big chair, and all the rest of that, um, they're afraid to say, I'm not getting much out of this. But no, you're a mm, consumer. Mm -hmm. If you've been seeing someone, my rule of thumb is the first appointment, you should experience some sense of value. Like they really get it, and they're on your side, and they've got a plan, and it's going somewhere. And if it doesn't meet those criteria, 
unless you just sort of want to, you know, use the therapy as a personal growth inquiry, drifting along, great. Otherwise, huh? if this therapy is not very productive, it's crowding out a therapy that could be productive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so for me, it's a contraindication. If early on, you don't feel like they really get you, there's no clear treatment plan, there's no relationship between their diagnostic formulation of you and the treatment plan and a reasonable expectation of milestones of improvement, that's standard in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Clear diagnostic formulation, what's going on? Why are, why are you feeling this way? What are we gonna do about it? And if you mm -hmm. do your part, client, what can we reasonably expect and we should be measuring progress against? Without those three things, you're wandering in the woods. If you're five or 10, 10 sessions in and you're not getting much from it, that's a contraindication and it's really time to talk about it. For starters, I love that you're framing this around the empowerment of the person who is in the client position. Yeah, Because I do think that it is very easy to, to fall into a mindset here where the therapist is the knower and the client is the receiver of that knowledge. And therefore, if the therapist is doing something, it must be right. And it's your job as the client to just kind of receive for a prescribed period of time, and then you're sort of done. Um, but the truth is that as near as we can tell, the, the most effective thing in therapy is the relationship between the client and the clinician. That most meaningful change is based on a strong therapeutic alliance, to use that phrase. So if you don't feel like you have a particularly strong therapeutic alliance, you're probably not going to get very far in that therapy. And most of the research suggests that the variation between modes of therapy is a lot less meaningful overall than the variation that individuals see with working with different kinds of therapists or different particular therapists. So it's not so much about the difference between like CBT and DBT or ACT or IFS or whatever else. It's much more about finding somebody that you feel like you connect and vibe with. Uh, does that seem more or less fair to you, Dad? The first thing I would say is that I'm, I'm aware of the research about therapeutic efficacy and so forth. And there, there are different ways of slicing that pie. And I think the relationship tends to be a proxy for some things that are themselves actually causative. In mm, other words, based mm -hmm. on the relationship, the client's actually more willing to do the stuff they talk about. Based on the relationship, the client's more vulnerable, and therefore, um, you know, they're getting into deeper material. In particular, I think that the real, the real bottom line is the last word in my four-word formulation, good change that lasts. It's what lasts. What is the internalization? of the benefits. And I've known clients who liked their therapist a lot. In a way, the fact that they liked their therapist a lot led them to perpetuate a therapy that actually wasn't that productive because they were mm. having good change in the therapy room, but it didn't last. Mm. It wasn't mm -hmm. getting converted to you know changes in neural structure or function, which is the necessary physical basis for a good change that lasts. And so maybe the relationship's great, but the bottom line is, is there a shift? Maybe it's just a shift in your relationship to the material, but bottom line, we're going after change. We're going after a shift. Yeah. That's why I like um, therapies and approaches such as focusing. That's all about the shift. EMDR mm -hmm. tends to be very much about the shift and tracking the shift. That's why coherence therapy and Bruce Ecker is so fantastic because he's really going after the underlying neurology of getting that shift to occur. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm a zealot about the, the, the last word there, lasts. You want the benefit that lasts. I do want to take a little bit of time here to talk about CBT for complex PTSD and other forms of developmental trauma specifically, because we've talked about this question a good bit without actually speaking to part of the yeah. question. Um, and it's interesting and complicated here. For starters, uh, CBT is widely considered to be the gold standard treatment for a variety of different issues, including PTSD. Um, cognitive behavioral-based interventions for acute PTSD are generally found to be extremely effective. But there is some suggestion that for more developmental issues of various kinds, cognitive behavioral approaches might not be the best for people. And one of the interesting reasons for this is that it's based on the work of people like Dr. Bruce Perry, who we've had on the podcast in the past, and it has to do with the way in which the brain develops over time. The really short version of this is that cognitive behavioral approaches 
rely on certain capabilities within the brain. They rely on the ability to hold a thought in our head and get some separation from that thought and be able to appraise those thoughts accurately, to be able to think differently about them. And all of those functions inside of our minds, inside of our brains, are based on essentially the most um, mature structures in there. The most modern, new, what makes a human a human structures that have to do with our cognitive facility. And the thing is that developmental trauma of various kinds can disrupt the, the building of those brain structures because the brain's a little bit like a house. It's built from the bottom up. Some of those features are the last features of the brain to develop. Mm -hmm. And so people like Bruce have done really interesting research on the different people that do and don't have access to that kind of capability inside of their brain. And so if you were somebody in particular who came from a very dysregulated, very uh, problematic environment as a young person, there might be some tools in there that you were essentially never taught how to access properly, or maybe were developed themselves in a kind of dysfunctional way. And that's why sometimes more bottom-up approaches can be more effective for people who have that developmental trauma history. With regard to CBT, including the mindfulness-based or you know heavily acceptance-based uh, approaches to CBT that are about, in effect, the cognition of a global perspective of uh, a kind of observing spaciousness in relationship to whatever experiences you're having with a sense of accepting of them and not identifying with them. That's a kind of a C, that's a kind of a cognition that gets brought in with some of these mindfulness-based approaches. And you're right, the evidence base for them is great. In that context, the question for me is two part. First part, are people actually believing the Cs? In other words, mm. you have to actually believe the new cognitions for them to last, for that to be the good change that lasts. You have to really develop the conviction about them. And if there are underlying dynamics that uh, keep disrupting the adoption of these new beliefs, then they're not going to sink in. Also, the B for behavior, you have to do the Bs. <laughs> you have to do the behaviors. And uh, does the client actually do the behaviors? Uh, so, there's a key question here. First of all, uh, is the person, uh, you know, really ready to adopt those new viewpoints and do those behaviors? Let's suppose they are, okay? And if they're not, then often what's appropriate is for a person to do a different kind of therapy before doing CBT, if at all. A therapy that's more focused on acquiring self-regulation self-soothing, self-calming, self-compassion, that, that can be really helpful because some of what's disrupting the adoption of these new points of view, new beliefs, uh, is, is deeper down. Um, the other thing is, even if a person is doing, you know, the new cognitions and the new behaviors, if they're not really relieving, let's say, their social anxiety, then you have to look at a deeper level. And that's where, as mm. I said, mm -hmm. you know, focusing on building up the inner resource of emotional regulation and somatic regulation is really useful. And also starting to access the deeper, younger, as you put it, you know, talking about Bruce Perry, um, layers of the psyche. Uh, I find often, to kind of sum up, in a way, I, I think of CBT as like a second stage or third stage therapy. Mm -hmm. If the foundation's already there, boom, hop on board. It's great. Um, on the other hand, if the foundations are not really there for it to take off, then I think laying those foundations first, you know, is a good practice. Great. I think that's a great way to summarize it. So I do want to move on to our third question here, and it's pretty simple. What is the most effective treatment for trauma that happened in childhood? Most effective for who, in what settings, with what history? Yeah, it's individualizing. So the most effective treatment is the one that's individualized to a person who is motivated to make use of it. That said, that's a great summary. I know yeah. in your wheelhouse, Forrest, because you're like a <laughs> you're like an A student. You're like an A plus student. Oh, thank you. Like I've done, done the research on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you walk us through some of what the research says on top of my kind of fortune cookie summary? 
Well, I think your fortune cookie summary is excellent because the truth is that there are some approaches that have a little bit more academic research validation than others and yeah. some that have a little bit less. But the truth is exactly what you said. There's no one size fits all answer here. Yeah. And there are going to be people who benefit enormously from a treatment and you might go and do that treatment and go, that sucked. I got no value out of that. This wasn't for me. I thought my therapist was a quack or whatever, and it, it just wasn't a good fit for you. And that's totally normal. And that doesn't make you wrong. And it also doesn't make the therapy that you attempted wrong. Um, and so I think it's important to just kind of lay that basis for everything else here. But there are a couple that maybe are particularly interesting interventions for people. And so a few of them, first, uh, again, Bruce Perry, neurosequential model of therapeutics. That's his approach to trauma work. And there are people who are trained in it, clinicians who are trained in it that a person can work with. And then related to that, other trauma-informed or trauma-focused forms of cognitive behavioral therapy can really be really helpful for people. Then a few more. Narrative therapy can be really helpful. That was developed by Michael White and David Epstein. Um, and it helps people really reframe their life stories by looking at some of the dominant narratives that they've absorbed over time. And a lot of those narratives, of course, are formed in childhood. So it can be really helpful for those kinds of stories that we're telling ourselves. Then, as you said, Dad, EMDR. EMDR can be really helpful for some people. Some people get kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, but for those for whom it is useful, it is really, really useful. Uh, EMDR really helped me out personally. Yeah. Then a few that we've talked about on the podcast regularly, internal family systems therapy that was developed by Richard Schwartz, and then acceptance and commitment therapy, which was developed by Steve Hayes. And these are both sort of more third wave, they're sometimes called therapies, which are a little bit more mindfulness driven, a little bit more about awareness of the interior. They can sometimes be a little softer in their approach. Um, so as you were saying, Dad, if you're somebody where those kind of like hardcore cognitions and behaviors talk like isn't really for you right now for whatever reason, those might be a little bit more accessible. So those are some of the ones that I would name. The final one that I would mention is just various forms of somatic therapy. Uh, my partner, Elizabeth, is a somatic therapist, and uh, particularly somatic experiencing was developed by Peter DeLevine, who we've talked with on the podcast. I think that we actually might be talking with Peter again sometime soon. Yeah. And uh, he's a really cool guy. Videos of his work are very interesting because uh, he has just such a unique approach to working with people. So those are some that I would name here. Mm. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Dad? Yeah. Uh, first off, I would just note that that great list is heavily North American. And mm, mm -hmm. um, so one thing I want to add to it definitely sure, is a good point. Yeah. yeah, compassion focused therapy from Professor Paul Gilbert, uh, the Compassionate Mind Foundation in UK. Uh, he's got the received the Order of the British Empire. It's a really well developed, highly evidence based, a couple decades old therapeutic process that was really aimed for people who'd had a lot of trauma. You name narrative therapy, that's out of Australia. But uh, just want to kind of broaden it more globally. So that yeah, would be. No, uh, I think that's a good point. And then, can I tell you my gardening theory of therapy? I, I'm very open to a gardening theory of therapy here, Dad. I'm yeah, very your partner's a great, one. great plant Yeah, great person. gardener. There you there go. There you are. Yeah. All right, here we go. So, we had, the mine is a garden, it's got weeds and flowers. All right. So, What's the most effective treatment for trauma that happened in childhood? We kind of start there. One is to step back from the garden altogether and to be able to witness it and accept it uh, with compassion for yourself. So you kind of step back from the mind. That's a very important thing to do. Second very important thing to do is to grow flowers. Before going after those weeds, what are the flowers? That would help you inside, like self-calming, self-soothing, uh, impulse control, being able to slow down reactions before you're already 60 miles an hour down that, down that low road highway. Uh, over time, building up the sense of others who care about you. Over time, building up a sense of your own good heart, your own native goodness. That's number two. Number three, cover the weeds with flowers. Much CBT and other methods are about associating positive states to previously negative material. And the nature of the brain is that those flowers then gradually cover over the weeds. 
and the weeds then are not present in consciousness. That's a good thing to do, totally worth doing. The problem though, is that if the weeds are not fully uprooted, which means that their physical trace is changed deep in the bowels of the memory networks of the brain, uh, those weeds can come back with a vengeance. They're just dormant uh, if they're re-triggered or there's a thing that happens. And many people have had this experience that they thought they had handled something and then they stepped into a situation, maybe they were particularly vulnerable and holy moly, they were fully hijacked. That takes us to the fourth thing to do, which is to pull the weeds. That's where you use positive material to fully associate to the negative material and gradually replace it, in part by disrupting the reconsolidation of the negative material, the weeds, in the physical networks of memory. Bruce Ecker has done a lot of work on that. I've written about how to do that as well in Hardwiring Happiness. You're getting down to the deep material. And when you do this, to finish, really important point, that, when, that goes to something you said previously related to uh, Bruce Perry's work. Effective treatments for trauma ultimately need to get down to the tip of the root of the weed, and therefore they need to be matched to the developmental level of that root. So if the trauma occurred in late adolescence, then you can kind of get at it with rational, language-based, you know, heavily C for cognitive approaches. But if that tip of the root is pre-verbal, uh, below episodic memory, there's no actual recollection of what happened, but at some deep level of your body remembers, as Bessel van der Kolk put it, you know, in the title of his book, then the resource that is like a weeder, because I did a lot of weeding as a kid, that's digging up the tip of the root of the dandelion, the resource experience needs to be developmentally matched, which is to say, typically nonverbal, highly soothing, concrete, the ways in which you would respond to a child of your age when you were traumatized. If you were to respond to that child today, how would you respond? And then th that can then help to accomplish the full uprooting of that material. You'll remember what happened. You may still have a certain vulnerability, a minor, small vulnerability to it, vulnerability to it, but it won't preoccupy you and it won't hijack you so fully. I thought that was a great, a great way to think about it, Dad. And for starters, just like a really great outline of your taking in the good process, which is kind of the basis of a lot of your, a lot of yeah. your approaches to this stuff. But also the way that you um, talked about the developmentally appropriate nature of the treatment that we're applying, based on the unique experiences that we had, and that then gets back to the what's the most effective treatment? Well, it's the one that's matched to your situation and your condition and your. Yeah your unique way of being in the world. Uh, so it's a very difficult question to ask, but a lot yeah. of it is about kind of focusing on um, what you were talking about earlier around, hey, if it's not working for you in a couple of sessions, at least on some level, then maybe it's time to reevaluate what kind of treatment you're doing or who you're working with. So our fourth question, I'm wondering if I should talk about my abusive childhood to my almost grown up kids while I'm still in the process of healing. It might help them understand things better, but I also don't want to put too much on them. So what do you think about this, Dad? It's really interesting. I think a little bit of it has to do too with cultural norms. What I mean is mm, that mm -hmm. if you're having a really happy functioning family uh, with almost adult kids, and you're in a cultural setting in some part of the world uh, or some part of America perhaps, uh, in which people just don't talk about that stuff, then it could be kind of, whoa, mind-blowing, you know, if a parent just sort of, well, this is what happened to me when I was your age or, you know, when I was young. Kaboo. On the other hand, if you're in Marin County <laughs> or maybe, I don't know, <laughs> somewhere in Boston or Boulder, Colorado, uh, where people kind of much more normatively, much more commonly talk about their inner world and it's not a big deal, and then it, then it may not be such a shocker. So that's actually an interesting thing to think about going into it. Second thing is, I find the key question is, what's the purpose 
I mean, kids are yeah, very totally. good. That's where yeah. I was going to go to. Yeah, they really can read the intent, and they're kind of suspicious appropriately about parental intent. Like, I, uh, you know, speaking of you, Forrest, but anyway, so appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so if your intent is that you're not turning them into your therapists, your kids, you're not turning your kids into your therapists, and your intent is to simply share and to kind of help them understand you. Like my parents, gosh, it would have blown my mind if they'd ever come to me when I was a teenager, let's say, and said, you know, Rick, yeah, I didn't really like that you did that thing to your sister and I kind of yelled at you about it, but really just didn't, just, you know, um, blah, 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 blah. Something about their own childhood or just how it landed on them. Oh my gosh, I would have felt so close to my parents and a lot of my defenses would have melted. It would have been a really good thing. And... um not for the parents to do some kind of chest pounding, mea culpa, mea culpa, but just being real. I tend to be biased broadly toward giving kids information. I think sometimes we underestimate the capacity of our kids to just be able to handle the truth. Yeah. I'm yeah. a little biased in that direction. So that's, beware my bias. I, I think that what you said about like, what's the purpose of this is such a huge part of the yeah. whole thing. Like you said, I think most people have a pretty good nose for what's going on beneath the surface and you can kind of smell it if something's coming from a, a desire to get a certain kind of thing from you or a plea for a certain kind of emotional attention or whatever it might be. And while those pleas might be understandable, often our, our kids don't want to perform that work for us also, understandably. Yeah. Um, and so if you're really reaching for that, I, I would be very cautious about that. Yeah. But if the desire is explanatory in nature, like you were saying, Dad, hey, you know, this is kind of why I am this way about this particular thing, and it might help you to understand me better if you kind of know a little bit more about it, then I think that would be great. And layered on top of that, if during this process of informing your children of this thing in this way, you can kind of tell that they don't want to be there. Don't make them be there. I, yeah, I think is like the point. big thing that I would just toss out here is that like if you get started in this and it gets uncomfortable or it gets weird or you just can tell that they would rather be somewhere else, there's totally a place for being like, hey, you know, never mind, my bad. Catch you on the flip side. Let's keep it moving here. And, and to just be okay with that as a possible outcome in that kind of an interaction. I think that if you can do that, you can move forward and give it a try. If, again, if it's appropriate to their developmental stage, whatever it is that you're talking with them about, um, and you feel like you're coming at it, like you said, Dad, not trying to turn your kids into the therapist, but because you want them to know something about you. That's great. So let's talk about the next question, which, again, has to do with an aspect of therapy here, Dad. So we're really hitting you in your sweet spot today. <laughs> What do you think about therapists drawing clear therapeutic boundaries with their friends? I'm an IFS practitioner, and I've struggled to maintain my friend interactions without blending into more of a therapist role for them. I'd like things to just feel like a normal friend interaction without being placed into the role of therapist. And as a newer practitioner, I find I've found that challenging. So what do you think about this, Dad? Here too, I have a kind of bias, you know, in the spectrum. I mean, um, on the one hand, I'm kind of a wild guy, but what enables that is good boundaries. Being clear about boundaries is important. So one way to answer the question is, imagine that uh, you are a physician or an attorney, and your friend is talking with you about something or other that overlaps what you know. How would you be about it? You would probably be kind of matter of fact. You wouldn't really get into the depths of it. Um, you'd encourage them to find a professional, not you, to deal with their medical issue or their accounting issue. Uh, and it, it would be kind of straightforward. So I think that's a way into thinking about what's an appropriate way to be. And you can usually tell when a conversation is starting to move from you're being a good friend who is sharing something they know, something that you know right? That might be of use to somebody. And you're, you're having a friend to friend conversation about inner practice. And maybe your friends have some background with inner practice of their own. Maybe they've done some mindfulness things, or they've had a different kind of therapy. So it's more like friend, friend, right? 
But wow, as soon as it starts to feel, to me at least, and you can just feel it in your body almost, that they're starting to set you up or you're starting to set yourself up as the more enlightened or psychologically healthy person, that's a real warning signal. If you're starting to feel also that they're using you as a means to their ends and the relationship is not reciprocal, that the conversation is always about them, it's not roughly 50-50 about you as well, that's a warning sign. And the last warning sign is one where they keep kind of milking you for the same information. They keep bringing up the same problem and you really go to the mat. You really tell them what you know. You really get excited about what they could do. And then the next time you see them, it's the same old, same old. They're not moving forward. It may be they're even using the interaction with you as a kind of gesture in the direction of healing and self-help because that's all they want to make. It's just a gesture rather than actually doing the work to change for the better over time. So those are warnings for me. Inside that frame, hey, it's great to just talk about practice with people who are interested in it. Yeah, so let's say, Dad, that you're in an interaction with somebody mm -hmm. and they've brought some kind of emotional material to you. Yeah, They know you're a therapist. You're also their friend. And, yeah. and you can, you know, you start getting into the emotional material a little bit because you're talking with them as, as yeah. you would a friend about emotional material. It happens. Yeah. And then you can you can feel like we're starting to enter the murky depths here in a way yeah. that makes you uh, have an alarm bell go off in your head, where you're like, "Oh, we're starting to enter therapist territory." Yeah. How do you how do you deal with that? How do you navigate it? Do you say to the person, "Hey, Jim, this is therapist territory, and I probably shouldn't be doing some therapy with you. I'm happy to give you a referral or do whatever or blah blah blah, whatever it is that you say." Or do you just kind of go there one time, but the second time it happens, you say, hey, once is okay, but twice is too many. Like, how do you navigate that whole sort of situation? It's a great question. So how it is for me. Yeah. And people can and take it. And I just it. want to say really quickly, I have a bunch of friends who are therapists and they all talk about this as being like a thing that people struggle with and it is a real thing. So that's, that's part of why I thought it was interesting. Yeah. What I do is I try to talk about it like two co-equals who are exploring the mind together. And one of them yeah. is sharing some of the things they know in a way that really respects the autonomy of the other person and doesn't move into any kind of hierarchical relationship. Second, occasionally I'll mark that move into actually uh, engaging their mind in some therapeutic way explicitly, but I'll really mark it and I won't spend much time there, five, 10 minutes at the most. You'll get permission, you'll say, hey, yep. I'm kind of wandering into therapist territory here. I'm not your therapist. We're not yeah. going to really do this. Are you sure you want to have this conversation? Totally, yeah. Yeah, and then and I won't go past that. So that's how I deal with it. I just and don't go you past it. it. Yeah. And often uh, as co-equals, we can move into compassion. We can move. We can we can rest in inquiry. And I, I you know, I think the most important thing in a way is who. Who's holding the responsibility, hot potato? And so much of what you're trying to do as a therapist also is you're trying to move the hot potato into the hands of the client so that they are the active agent. And they're the ones who need to do certain things or seek certain help uh, if they're going to get better. And, you know, it's rather than I'm responsible, mm, they're mm -hmm. responsible. Yeah, I think that's great. Now here at the end, we've got two other questions that are not about either complex PTSD or about how to do therapy, so a little bit different. I was just diagnosed with ADHD as a 24-year-old woman. Any advice, suggestions, thoughts on meds, and so on? Well, I have a canned spiel, so I'm going to do it fast, okay? And <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you can give me the, that, that, that you know, I'll get off in. the stage signal anytime you want. <laughs> yeah, Paris. totally. Okay, Apply the hook. First off, I would just step back and think about that quote-unquote diagnosis. And the way to think about any diagnosis is what, why, and how, and how to help. What is the actual, where is the person in their characteristics in the population? So ADHD has three preeminent and really fourth defining characteristics that vary. So just think about this. Um, distractibility, stimulation seeking, 
impulsivity, and emotional dysregulation. Okay, So you think about where is the person roughly in the distribution of people more or less like them? Uh, some in terms of gender, uh, you know, social class, cultural background, roughly where are they in the distribution? And the typical cutoff loosely for an ADHD diagnosis is that you're roughly in the upper 5%. So the what is purely descriptive. It's not yet explanatory. They're, they're really about where are you in the distribution compared to some norms, all right? So now let's suppose that a person is, yeah, uh, in the upper 5% loosely of one or more of those characteristics. Uh, then the question becomes why? Very important. Is it because you have a biological, temperamental, constitutional inclination to be that way in the normal distribution of temperament in the human genome? That's a classic textbook ADHD. You're, you're just, you're this way. Or have you been traumatized? And understandably, you're very destructible because you're so vigilant. Uh, or you, and you're also dealing with a lot of internal material that's just erupting all over the place. Or are you destructible uh, and inattentive because you're dealing with a health issue? Uh, or maybe you've had a shocking loss recently and you're internally preoccupied and can't focus. Uh, one of the um, you know, characteristics of, of you know, a depressive episode for many people is poor concentration. I can't focus. So what's the why, right? And or have you grown up in a really chaotic environment where you survived by being you know, hypervigilant and really just kind of moving from this to that. What's the why? Very important. So now then, how to help. Um, let's suppose that the why is that this is actually a constitutional, temperamental, endogenous characteristic. That's how you are. My five-part plan, no surprise, is number one, nurture the heck out of the person. Having, um, being in the, you know, spirited ADHD and the temperamental range exposes people in our culture to lots and lots of criticism and sometimes disappointments uh, and failures. So nurture the heck out of yourself. Really, really important. Second, optimize your physiology because ADHD is a, it's basically, it's about dysregulation. So you want to minimize demands for regulation, such as underlying health issues, and you want to reduce that which is dysregulated in your body, in your GI tract, in your immune system, in your endocrine system, uh, in your cardiovascular system, your musculoskeletal system. You want to optimize physiology. And often uh, it's uh, more accessible to intervene in physiology, including younger people, than it is in other things. Okay, optimize physiology. Third, um, supportive environments. You know, I've known people who could not study unless it was perfectly quiet. I've known other people who could not study unless the TV was playing quietly in the background. And uh, I still remember the client I saw once, or I saw for a while, uh, by the time he was about 12, highly hyperactive, neuroatypical, uh, cried all the time as an infant until his mother had the bright idea of putting a TV in his room and turning it on 24-7 because he needed that stimulation to calm down. So tune your environments to your needs, right? Uh, what kind of job is really appropriate for you? What kind of relationship is appropriate for you? Do that, okay? Fourth, inner skills. Mindfulness and mindfulness training and attention training have good, you know, decent research support for, you know, having at least a mild benefit here for distractibility and attention regulation issues. Also, train in the executive functions. There's, you know, not much we can do to budge our fundamental temperament before we talk about medication, which is number five. But, uh, you know, in terms of inner skills, uh, how you manage your own impulses, how you buy yourself time, for example, before you do anything is it, so as an inner skill, so you're not too impulsive, um, being able to really slow down to internalize beneficial experiences because someone who's skittering on to the next thing continuously is often moving away from the current beneficial experience of something you want to grow inside before it has time to be registered in the neural nets of memory. So slow it down. You know, develop inner skills of various kinds. That's number four. Now, for a lot of people, that will get them the whole way. On the other hand, meds, psychostimulants typically, when they work, 
can be mind blowing. It's like putting on a pair of glasses when you've been nearsighted and suddenly the world snaps into focus. So netting it all out, um, you know, I think always do the four, uh, which is to say, nurture the heck out of yourself, optimize physiology, optimize your environments as best you can, acquire inner skills. And then if in addition to all that, uh, you, you, you want to explore medication, then talk to someone who's highly experienced with meds, is my suggestion, psychiatrist typically, not a general MD. Um, and pragmatically to finish, realistically, some people are just not going to be able to do the first four very much, or they've done some of it, but you know they're not oriented that way. And then pragmatically, maybe they could solve the whole problem by really, really, really doing the first four super strenuously, but eh, it's just a lot easier to take some Adderall. And that works for them. Mm. And that's great. Mm -hmm. And I've known a number of people who uh, got tremendous benefit from it. Some of the risks that were laid out initially that it would predispose people for amphetamine addiction have generally not been found to be the truth. And as someone who teaches meditation retreats, my point of view is if, you know, some green tea in the morning or some Adderall, you know, helps you kind of stay focused for what you really are there to do in the retreat, maybe a skillful means. Yeah. So Elizabeth went through this recently. She was recently formally diagnosed with ADHD in her early 30s. And I think that for a lot of her life, she really felt like she was swimming with a cinder block around her leg. Mm, yeah. And relatively recently, she began taking Adderall. Um, and it was totally transformative for her. Yeah. It was totally transformative for her. And and not just for her ability to to focus and concentrate and stay on task, although of course it helps with that. One of the primary features of ADHD for many people is what's called rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Mm -hmm. um, that's a fancy way to say that they are very prone to feeling extremely bad around any yeah. rejection, real or perceived. Yeah. Um, another feature of ADHD is hypersensitivity of various kinds touch hypersensitivity, sound hypersensitivity, uh, the texture of something really bugs you. Just all of these sensitivity features of the brain are turned up for some reason. She took Adderall, all that symptomology went away. All of it went away. It wasn't just the ability to focus, it was everything else. Now, not everyone is going to get that kind of magic carpet ride from 10 milligrams of Adderall a day. Mm. Um, she was able to do this on a very low dosage because she is a sensitive person just in general and has had essentially no issues with it, no major side effects, no big problems. Um, she's clearly in the top 5 to 10% of people who are going to get the, the greatest benefit from Adderall to the least harm from it. So, you know, don't necessarily take that experience as like the way it will necessarily be for you. Mm. But it's just been such a clear demonstration of the power of these medications under the right circumstances for the right people. There are a lot of issues with accessing medication, finding a psychiatrist, uh, dealing with Adderall shortages, which are a thing right now, and all of these various other complications here. But if you can get to it and if it works for you, no shame in taking it for sure. And to context, just to reiterate what we reiterate often is that we're not offering medical advice and yeah. um you know these decisions are really up for the individual and and in that context then yeah did you want to say more about this for us I yeah i, I, I just in. want to say one other final thing at the end here yeah. which is that i think one of the biggest things particularly maybe with adhd but i can think of some other tendencies that people have that would also fall into this category it's something that you've talked about a lot, Dad, which is changing our relationship to these kinds of diagnoses, and particularly the framing of them as disordered in some way. And one of the things that you've said about ADHD is that fundamentally it's an issue of fit. It's a bad fit between one person's unique uh, disposition, psychology, cosmology, whatever's going on inside there, and the modern circumstances that we find ourselves in today. A lot of good reasons to believe that temperamental variation inside of a small group of people uh, had some benefits for evolution. Certainly, ADHD wasn't problematic enough that it got evolved out of the population. Obviously, it's all a little bit more complicated than that, but just to grossly oversimplify here. 
But in a modern circumstance where you're expected to sit at a desk for eight hours a day mm. and uh, focus on your homework for however many hours a night and be quiet and behave in the classroom, then it's not such a great fit. But that doesn't mean that you are bad. It means that there is a fit issue here. And understanding things in that way can help us develop like much greater self-compassion around it and to really understand our tendencies as not being problems, even if they are occasionally problematic for us. That's great. Absolutely awesome. fantastic. And there are um, wonderful books about um, ADHD. I'm, I dispute the D. I think it's a functional disorder, but it's really, I think our society is much more disordered than people who are, you know, spirited and distractible and often very creative and sometimes impulsive. So I think the D resides in our society that that said I'm I'm that cranky guy who wants society to get off his lawn. <laughs> so, or, or at least act differently if you're on my lawn. But then, you know that's, that's a great said. way to put it. Yeah. And the other is that there are just wonderful critiques of um and perspectives on society. Uh, going back to all the way back to the work of R.D. Lang, some of the classics um, who really talk about uh, the importance of not pathologizing, uh, just uh, atypicality. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful perspective just in general for considering what to do when facing a certain kind of issue and particularly to consider the broader circumstances that you're finding yourself in, whether that be your unique history as we talked about finding the right therapist for you, um, what happened to you in the past, thinking about what kinds of therapeutic approaches might be beneficial for you, and then also thinking about how your unique uh, circumstances or unique traits are a fit or not a fit from the with the conditions that you find yourself in. And all of those things contribute overall to how happy we are and how, how good we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And so many of those things are outside of our control. Fantastic. Today, Rick and I answered a number of questions from our listeners, and I just want to take a moment to say here at the end that we really appreciate all of the questions that we receive from you. And we can only do episodes like this because we get so many great questions. Uh, we get more than we could ever possibly realistically answer on the show, but we do appreciate everybody who takes the time to send them in, even if we aren't able to get to your question. If you'd like to have a question answered on a future episode of the podcast, your best way to do that is by joining us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast because I ask there pretty regularly for question submissions from our patrons. But if you would like to message us in general, you can always reach out to contact at beingwellpodcast.com. The first question came in from somebody who was finally in a emotionally healthy relationship and felt that they were just waiting around for inevitable rejection and pain and loss. And they were concerned that their anxieties about this would end up bringing about what they feared. And one of the things that we emphasized here is that our anxieties don't actually prevent the things that we're afraid of. And obviously, the questioner realizes that because they sent in this question. Uh, but that's just a very important place to start here. As long as we're attached to our defenses around a particular issue, like we're attached to the anxieties that we have about something, and we think that those anxieties are truly protecting us in some way from the things that we fear, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do something about them. And then in answering this question, Rick really emphasized uh, taking the good, you know, classic Rick, where he was talking about really turn toward the positive experiences that you're having right now in the moment. When you have those anxieties arise in your mind, take a moment to ground down, look around at your life right now, drop into the reality that this is a great partner who does really care about you, all of that good stuff, and let the truth of the moment calm down the mind. The second question led to a pretty long conversation between Rick and me about how therapy works, why therapy works, and the kinds of benefits people can expect to get from therapy. And it focused on whether CBT was a good intervention for people who have developmental trauma issues. To summarize what we talked about really quickly, I talked a bit about the ways in which CBT might be a tricky uh, form of therapy for people with developmental injuries to access. And Rick really emphasized how whenever we're doing a therapy, the goal is to get down to the tip of the root, to really remove the whole issue. And if you're doing work focused on a target that existed in early childhood, 
you need to have a intervention that is developmentally appropriate for the age you were when you received that injury, because these injuries are kind of frozen in time a little bit. And CBT relies on some of the most uh, most adult structures in our brain. So if we have a young part of ourself that is dealing with this kind of issue, using a very talky adult structure might not be the best way to deal with it. Then along the way, we talked a lot about therapy in general. And one of the points that Rick made that I thought was really important is that end of the day, this is all individual. Therapy works for a person because of that person's unique situation and the therapist they're working with and their unique life circumstance and all of that different stuff. It's very hard to generalize here about what kind of therapy is going to work for you because we don't know the answers to all of those different questions. We then answered a question about whether it was appropriate to talk to children, a person's child, about their own abusive childhood. And what we really emphasized here was two things. First, again, developmentally appropriate material. Uh, A lot of this depends on the kid in question and their age and where they're at in their own life journey, whether or not that's going to be a helpful thing for them to hear or to learn about. And the second thing is to be really thoughtful about why you're doing something. Are you doing it because you just want to inform them or you think it might be helpful for them to know about you? Or are you doing it because you're trying to turn your kid into your therapist or you're trying to get a certain kind of emotional response from them that would be really fulfilling for you to hear. And so if you're coming at it with those more egocentric motivations, that's when it becomes a lot dicier. Then we talked about drawing clear therapeutic boundaries. And what Rick really emphasized here is that if you're a therapist, you can't be a therapist to your friend. And it's generally best to exit those kinds of therapeutic moments Uh, appropriately but briskly. It's okay to have a moment where you're psychoeducating somebody about an issue or, hey, if you really get clearance from them and you really talk about it and you're very clear that this is a bounded interaction, it's not going to happen this way again, but I'm okay here with doing two minutes of just telling you what I see about this thing that you're dealing with, that can be okay. But wandering from there into repetitive interactions with a person where you're serving as their proxy therapist is not going to be either good for you or good for the person that you're talking to. And then we talked about dealing with adult ADHD and how to approach a diagnosis as an adult. Rick had his five-point plan here, classic Rick, where he talked about all of these different ways that we can intervene with this kind of a challenge. The first four of them were really about our own efforts, and the fifth one was about considering medication. And if you're not somebody who has access to those first four, or if those first four don't do it for you, then yeah, definitely consider medication, understanding that uh, this is not medical advice and I am certainly not a doctor. If you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe through whatever platform you're listening to it right now on and maybe even leave a rating and a positive review. It really does help us out. And thanks again to everyone who sent in questions for this episode. We really appreciate it. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.